Okay, Mingalaba. I'm very much looking forward to our class today because we're studying Hebrews and James. And so by way of <clears throat> introduction, <clears throat> all of the New Testament writers have in their mind, are influenced by Judaism. You, you remember that, right? And that was what James Dunn said, is there are three big influences on the New Testament writers. And the Second Temple Judaism was one of those three influences. Judaism, the coming of Jesus Christ, and the coming of the Holy Spirit are the three big influences on their writing. There were other influences as well, such as the circumstances of the early church. And so today when we, we look at Hebrews and James, okay, uh, so let's begin with a prayer. Dear loving God, we thank you for another day and another opportunity for us to study scripture together. We pray that this will be an enriching uh, time of learning for every student. But I pray too that you'll give them new insights into the meaning of these texts and the value of these texts for their own personal life and also for their teaching uh, in the years to come. And so we commit this time and this whole morning into your hands and pray that your spirit will be here working in uh, helpful ways. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so go ahead and look at your notes in your guide because I'm going to be reading some of those notes uh, as part of the lecture. So I think we're at about page 68. Does that sound right? Yes. And I'm just going to remind you a little bit of the, of the introductory facts. The early church attributed the letter to the Hebrews to Paul. But few modern scholars hold this view. The author was familiar with Paul and his theology is compatible with Paul, Paul's. And he, but he was some anonymous writer that held in his, who was held in esteem in his day, but whose identity is lost to us today. Now, the genre, do you, do you know that word genre? What does it mean? It, genre is just like the type of literature. And there's different kinds of genres in the New Testament. Uh, typically we say there are four. What, what kinds of genres are in the New Testament? We have Gospels, right? We have History, which is Acts, more or less. We have Epistles, which are letters written to individual churches or individuals. And we have Apocalyptic genre, which is what book? Revelation. Okay. So, Hebrews is an epistle, but I think we can be a little more specific. It reads, it reads like a sermon. And so Hebrews is like one long sermon, even though it's set up like an epistle. And I'll, 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 I'll point out to you as we go through this why I say it's a sermon. But he has, there are some real life situations in the background. There's a clear argument with vitally important exhortations and grave warnings for the readers. So and that's, and that is, is perhaps why I want to say it's a, a sermon, is that he's not just giving information. In the book of Romans, for example, Paul gives a, a, a detailed theological exposition. He's trying to describe the, why we need the gospel, who the gospel is for, what does the gospel mean. And when you get to chapter 12, there's some exhortation about how you should apply it. And so you could say there's a, a little sermonizing, if you will, in Romans. But Hebrew, <coughs> Hebrews is even stronger that way. It seems clear to me that all of his teaching really is geared up to lead towards an exhortation. An exhortation is like an urging, uh, a sermon, a preaching, to try to change the behavior, change the thinking and change the behavior of the Hebrews, his audience. Now Christology. 
Hebrews demonstrates the superiority of Jesus Christ. Who is he superior to? Well, he's superior to angels. He's superior to Moses. He's superior to the sacrifice of animals. And so, this is all within the context of recipients. Those are the people who get the letter. Who are in danger of lapsing from the Christian faith back to Judaism. Alright? So, do you, so have that in your mind. That I'm trying to help you see the context what we say over and over again in this class is that context is extremely important for interpreting the Old Testament, Old Testament, New Testament. And so context is not just about today. Context is about back then, too. So context is almost always relevant when we're studying uh, the biblical text. And so what's important here about the context is that it appears that the readers were Jewish Christians who were thinking about going back to Judaism, going back to the old faith. And so, so the writer is trying to convince them why that's a mistake, why they should not go backwards, they should go forwards. Okay, so that's the context. And, and I think that's relevant even today because Sometimes when we talk about theology, it's not clear what direction we're going. Are we going further with Christ or are we going back? Are we going back to a, a different kind of religion, a different kind of belief about God? Some people would even advocate going back to the pre-missionary days, pre-gospel days. I mean, you hear many different ideas. So my point is, it's still relevant, this idea of movement. Because wherever you are, Today, you came here as a Christian, probably fairly traditional Christian. So where are you going with your theology? What, what direction are you going? All right? So I, I'm only making that point as a, what we call a rhetorical question. I'm not looking for an answer. I'm just posing that question to help you realize that there's often movement in theology, theological thinking. And so that, that's part of what makes Hebrews so relevant. Because <clears throat> he's talking to people who are moving. And he's concerned about what direction they're moving. And so he's trying to urge them to move in a, another direction. So think about that as we read the text. So here in Hebrews, you see that there, there's no greeting. There's no, uh, how are you? I'm fine. There's no, I'm writing to you to see how you're doing. He just jumps right in with his message. And that's another reason why some people say this is really a sermon. It's, it's just, this is, he gets right to the message. And, uh, and, and again, look at Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. He says, in the past he spoke to our ancestors. So there's a clue to the context. Whose ancestors? He, the Jewish people. So this is a Jewish context who profits in many ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Okay, so what, what is he doing here? Uh, rhetorically, he's setting up a contrast. The old ways of, of receiving are through the prophets. The new way is through his son. And so this is just the first of many times where, where the author is contrasting the old way, the, the, how God spoke through Jewish prophets and leaders, and now through a son. And the intention here is to elevate the son above all the others who came before him. And that's why in our notes here, I say the, the author maintains a very high Christology. That's his understanding of Christ's person, qualities, and work as a pr prophet, priest, and king. Christology in Hebrews is almost as high as that found in John's writings. And so it's very, very high. And so this is another testimony in the New Testament that says Jesus Christ was not just a great man. He wasn't just one more great religious figure in a long line from Moses to the prophets to King David to Jesus to et cetera, et cetera. That's not how the writer thinks. He puts all of the Old Testament people in high esteem and then he says, but Jesus is even higher.
And so that he is the unique son of God. And again, look at verse 3 for Christology. <clears throat> this sounds a little bit like what passage in Paul? Does anybody remember? The sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Who can remember what passage in Paul has a really high Christology and talks about Jesus being the image of the invisible God? One, Colossians chapter 1. Now that's a really good chapter to know. Uh, so, this sounds very much like it comes right out of there. And maybe this is one of the reasons why some people thought, well, maybe the writer is Paul. But you can have the same theology without being the same writer. Or you could be influenced by Paul. So, we don't think it's the same writer, but we think he knew of Paul and was influenced by Paul's theology. Uh, but I want, the point I'm making here is get the main point here that the writer's Christology is very high, as high as Apostle Paul's, and uh, really sees Son of God not just as a, a special agent of God like King David, who was also a son of God, considered a son of God, but he is actually equal with God. He's someone who, who shows us who God is, and is able to, and who participates in the very work of God in sustaining the universe. So now let's talk about soteriology. The author provides a very clear statement of the doctrine of atonement against the Jewish backdrop. So we've talked a little bit about atonement already, but this is a very important theological concept. You know, how is it that we're saved? The underlying conviction of the author, the New Testament is built upon Old Testament themes. Now compare that to the Epistle of Barnabas. That's another book from the early second century. And in the Epistle of Barnabas, Barnabas argues that the Jews have misunderstood the Old Testament. That is, they shouldn't have taken the Leviticus commands literally but allegorically. All right. So, when the writer of Hebrews is, in a sense, arguing with the Jewish people, he's not saying what Barnabas said. Barnabas said, Jewish, <coughs> Jewish uh, writers, you misunderstood the Old Testament. The writer of Hebrews does not say that. He says, no, you understood it correctly. But, what you don't understand is that Jesus now is greater than everything that preceded it. So that's the difference. Number two, the writer affirms what Judaism taught. Without blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. All right, we'll come back to that a little later. Uh, but this is a relevant point uh, because one of the things that uh, John Hick brings up is that Jesus can forgive he gives examples of Jesus forgiving without a sacrifice. And he says, look, God can forgive, Jesus can forgive, we don't need to have blood. And he uses that as a way to say, we don't need to look at Jesus' death on the cross as a blood sacrifice. And so there are many others today who don't like the idea of a blood sacrifice. Uh, I don't particularly like the idea myself. Uh, but, but when we're doing New Testament theology, you must read the text carefully. And the, t the writers of the New Testament believed in blood sacrifice. So now you can discuss it, but don't say they don't believe in it, because they do. All right? They do. And the writer of the Hebrews is absolute, it's, it's critical to his argument. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins, he says. And so that's his, where his point is. All right, as I said, we'll come back to that a little bit later. Ethics and discipleship. He addresses the problem of moral laxity and persecution in the church. And his answer, what I mean by that is, it seems to me that in the early church, there was this idea that if you accept Christ as your savior, if you're baptized, then you're regenerated. You're born again. You're, uh, 
you are a follower of Christ, so you put away the old and you live the new. Well, what does the church do when, when a baptized Christian sins? What do you do if they renounce their faith? Do you let them come back? <clears throat> do you tell them they're out for good? This was a real problem at the end of the first century and the second century because different church leaders had different solutions. Uh, you know, in some traditions uh, in, the, in the world today, there's the concept of backsliding. Do you have that in Myanmar? Backsliding? It's more of a Pentecostal idea. And I know you're mostly Baptists here, or a few Presbyterians and Anglicans. But there are some Christian traditions that talk about backsliding and you need to be saved again. All right, so it's not, a, it's not just an ancient problem. The question of what, what do you do about people who appear to have drifted away? You know, the issues today sometimes are the, those who commit great immorality or those who are alcoholics, right? The church sometimes wonder, what, well, what are we supposed to do with these people? How are we supposed to think about them? If we say they're Christians, then it makes Christianity look bad. But if we say they're not Christians, then it, are we saying that God's grace can't forgive them? So it's a dilemma. What, what do we do with these people? And of course, most of us are in the middle. Nobody's perfect, but hopefully we're not too bad. But, then, but there are some that, that are bad enough, or we think, they're bad enough that we, we think we have to say something or do something. Do we kick them out of the church? In some traditions shun people. And they say, you're out until you repent. So, again, my point is this, is, this is an ongoing challenge for churches to know how to handle it when people turn their back on the faith or seem to, to just enter into sin without caring about, about their sin. So, what is this author's answer to that question? Well, what we have in Hebrews is preaching with a warning without ever defining exactly where the point of no return might be. Compare the Shepherd of Hermas. That's another 2nd century writing or late 1st century writing. And he allowed for one second repentance. So in other words, if you fell away, you turned away, you could repent one time and come back. But if you fell away again, you're finished. Okay? So it was, it was strict back then, in the early days. Uh, so, but again, you see, they, they were struggling. What do we do? Because people who follow Christ should follow him. If you don't, how can you call yourself a Christian? That's what they were thinking. Well, it's a legitimate question. We should be thinking about that too. And, and we're going to talk more about that, even when we talk about James. <coughs> and I, ho I hope you got some idea from Paul that this issue of needing to repent and to follow Christ's ways faithfully is the calling of every Christian. How we handle human failure and weakness is a pastoral question. For the writer of Hebrews, essentially what he does is he warns us and warns us and warns us that if you go too far, it's too late for you. You're going to be condemned, and you're going, there's no hope for you. But he never tells us exactly what that point is. How do I know if I've gone too far? He doesn't answer that question. So let's look at a few of these passages where this issue comes up. The first is Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 12. Okay, so what's the message of this passage? What is he te teaching them? Okay, so you have to think about this, all right? This is not an exegetical class, so we don't really have time to go into great depth. But I'm showing you this verse because we don't really have anything quite like this in Paul. Paul warns against those who will never inherit the kingdom of God. But this is addressing a particular issue of what we call relapse. In other words, they've, they've fallen back into sin. They've turned away from God. But notice here carefully who he's talking about. 
He says, those who have once been enlightened. That's not Buddhist enlightened, by the way. That just means they know the, they know the truth. Those who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age. So what he's trying to do is describe what it, those who really have been born again, those who really have had an experience with God that's been life-changing for them. They've, they've experienced, let's say, the forgiveness of God. They've experienced the joy of the Holy Spirit. It's been a real experience. <clears throat> so he's not talking about traditional Christians here who are just Christians because their parents are Christians. He's talking about people who actually experience God. But he says even those people can fall away. So that should be a warning to you. That's what he's saying. That should be a warning that there are people who actually have experienced God who fall away from God. And he says if, if they have actually have done that and they, they have, look, verse 6, and they have fallen away. In other words, they've gone away from the church, gone away from Christ, gone into life of sin. It's impossible to be bring them back to repentance. I, I have this feeling that I need to keep trying to ex explain to you the dynamic of of the Christian faith according to the New Testament. And the reason I, I feel this way is because the reality of traditional Christianity is so real here in Myanmar that I think it could be a barrier to you to understanding scripture. So let me try to say a little bit about that. So when I talk about traditional Christianity what I mean by that is, is, is when, and we'll say, we'll say it could be some of you, I don't know how, maybe all of you, I don't know, that, that the reason you're a Christian is because your village is Christian, your parents are Christian, and, and you, you only know being a Christian, you were born into a Christian home, and so you're a Christian because that's your family heritage. Just frankly as most Buddhists are Buddhists because that's their family heritage. That's very typical of religion all over the world. Most people are in a religion because their parents had that religion. So they're traditional, that's what I mean by that. There's nothing wrong with tradition. Traditions can be good. It provides stability. It provides a context for you. But here's what you can miss. The New Testament was not written to traditional Christians. There were no traditional Christians in the first century. It, it was written to people who converted to faith in Christ. Now many of them came out of the Jewish faith, but many of them were pagans. They were, they, they, they were polytheists. They believed in many gods. But they, at some point, they came into a relationship with Christ that was brand new. As for them, John called it being born again. And Paul talked about the, the comfort and the, the power of, the, of experiencing the Holy Spirit. He's, the writer of the Hebrews is talking about being enlightened, tasting the heavenly gift, sharing in the Holy Spirit. You see, it's alive. It's not traditional. <clears throat> it has nothing to do with their parents. It's, it's personal for them. And so what I've been trying to do in this class is to... It, and I'm trying to do a better job to help you understand that being a Christian isn't about perpetuating tradition according to the New Testament writers. It's about experiencing God. Now, do you understand that? This is so basic to the New Testament understanding. So that another way you might say it is I'd say it the way that that uh, we said it last week, the way Jesus said it to Nicodemus. Because Nicodemus was a traditional Jew. He was Jewish because his parents were Jewish. And, he, and just like many of you, you've grown up in a religious background and now you're going to become religious leaders. That was Nicodemus. Right? He was, grew up Jewish and was going to become, and he became a Pharisee. That was all fine and good. But it wasn't enough, according to Jesus. He said, 
Your religious background is good and fine, but you must be born again. You must experience God. That's what he's saying. You must experience the power of God. And so, when we talk about relapsing or falling away today, he's not talking so much about falling away from the traditional church. He's talking about falling away from a personal relationship with God. So that's, that's the context. And I, and I hope that you understand what I'm saying. And, and it's entirely possible, and likely, I hope, <laughs> that a traditional Christian will also have a personal relationship with God. So they're both together. But it's not automatic, is my point. It's not automatic. And so I want to make sure that when we read these texts, that you are you're putting yourself back in that context and realize this is something that they've come alive uh, because of, the, of their relationship with God. So, anyways, we could talk a lot more about what he's saying, the warning he's giving. And, but when he gets to 6, verse 6, I'm excuse me, chapter 6, verse 9, he says, but we are convinced of better things in your case, the things that have to do with salvation. So in other words, again, we don't know exactly the context here, why he's writing these words of warning. But he is warning them. And he's, he may be talking about other people who were part of their congregation and they left. That's one theory. One theory is that people left and he's saying, let them go. They're not coming back. So don't worry about them. It's impossible, once they've left, for them to come back to repentance. Which, which in this case means coming back to, to obedience to God and being part of the church. That could be the reason that he wrote this. We don't know for sure. But when he gets to verse 9, he's, he wants to reassure them. And so this is, this is very typical for pastoral work. On one hand... You rebuke them and warn them. And with the other hand, you pat them on the back and you comfort them. And that's what he's doing. You, both are going on here in Hebrews. There's warning, uh, there's rebuke, and then there's comfort and encouragement. So, okay, I think that's all I have to say about that. Let's look at one other very stark passage of warning. Chapter 10, verses 26 through 31. Okay, you see, this is a, a very intense passage, isn't it? Right, he's saying, if you are a believer, you're part of the church, you've, you've been baptized, you're commit, <clears throat> you've said you're committed to following Jesus, but you deliberately keep on sinning after you know all of these things, all the truth. He says, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire. Here's the idea of hell. So every once in a while you do have this concept of hell in the New Testament. Raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Now whether that's hell or whether that's like in the Old Testament where fire came from heaven and just destroyed them. Uh, we're not sure if it's destruction or hell. But it's serious, right? It, it means death. And the writer of the Hebrews draws on the examples from the Old Testament to say... There were many people in the covenant community who were destroyed by God because of their rebellion. And so the writer of the Hebrews doesn't just preach about the love of God. Even though that's the most important message in the Bible, the love of God and the grace of God. His message is a real warning that it's possible for those who are believers to be who, to go too far in their sinning and to be destroyed by God. Uh, that's his message. Now that causes all sorts of theological problems for, for, the, for the Reformed theologians, for Protestants. But you need to see that this is in the Bible. And this is where some preachers get this, this idea of preaching, warning, to Christians. Now generally speaking, 
I'm not in favor of evangelists preaching to Christians. I know that's kind of common in the Chin Hills. I don't know about other parts of, of Myanmar. I think evangelists should be preaching to non-Christians. But having said that, you can see that there, this kind of, of passage is something you might hear out of the mouth of an evangelist warning Christians to repent of their sins and to, to turn back to faithfulness in their relationship with God. So it's not entirely crazy. And maybe that shouldn't be, the, you know, shouldn't be very often, but it, it's here. It was a concern in the first century, and it's a concern in the second century. What's the alternative to warning people? Let's say we say, I, I don't want to warn people like this. I don't want to warn them they might be destroyed by God. The, the danger is you can have a church full of people who are sinning, who are complacent in their sin, and it becomes a dead church. The church isn't alive. It goes through the motions. It says the right words. But the people's hearts are dead and cold. And so, I, I imagine here, nobody likes these verses. Nobody wants to preach these verses, or very few of you. But on the other hand, do you want a dead church? Do you want a church where people are just mired in their sin? No, I don't think you want that either. So I'm not going to solve it for you, but our job in this class is to show you these texts and that get you thinking about how did the New Testament writers, how do they think theologically and how did they apply their theology practically in their church context? Because that's what you have to do. That's your assignment for your life, is to keep thinking about these things and wrestling with these issues. Okay, I think I'm, that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, so point number one on this outline was he was addressing the problem of moral laxity and persecution in the church. Uh, by the way, falling away might have also meant being intimidated or persecuted, and so they renounced their faith. So, so in other words, so here, here in chapter 10 he talks about sinning, but in, in that earlier passage in chapter 6, he might have been talking about falling away in the sense of, of being afraid and so denying their faith. You know, we, ha we have that happening here in Myanmar right now, in, in the Wa State, right? Do you know that? There were 200 churches that were shut down in August. And, and then the, all of the pastors were arrested and they tried to force them to renounce their faith and to promise to never preach again. So don't think that this is just the first century. <laughs> These things are still happening today and will happen again in the future. There are always forces of evil who are trying to shut down the Christian faith and trying to, to intimidate or make people afraid to be a follower of Christ. And how we handle that is important. So right now in Wall State, I can imagine that some people signed the paper that said they, they would never be Christian, that they would never worship Christ again so they could get out of jail. So how is the church going to handle that? Is the church going to let them back in? Or is the church going to say, no, you signed that paper, you're out. You can't join us. I don't know. I don't know what they're going to do. I'm going to go uh, teach there. I've been invited to go teach there in February, so I'm looking forward. It's not... It's not the Wa State where it happened, but it's where the Wa people are in Sean State that I'm going to go. So, but I'm going to meet some of the people, certainly, who know all about the situation. I'll ask them, what are you going to do? Because this is a real problem. Well, that's what I think was happening. That was happening in the first century with some of the persecution. And so here they're wrestling with this issue. Do we let them back in or not? Do they want to come back in or not? So that was, this is all about point number one on your outline. Point number two is there are some key exhortations to try to encourage the people. So let me show you uh, just one here. <coughs> Shortly after uh, this warning about uh, not sinning and the, and the judgment of God, in verses 35 to 39,
he says, so do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. And my righteous one will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. 39. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. Right? So, again, try to understand the context. Here are Jewish Christians. They've committed themselves to following Christ. They've been baptized. They believe in Christ. They've experienced God. But now some of them are turning back. Some of them are turning back because of the Jewish teachers. Some of them are turning back because of persecution. And they're wobbling, okay? Or waffling, you know, we could say. And so the writer addresses this practical problem by warning them, scaring them, and encouraging them. So he's got different methods to try to get them to get to be strong and to keep going forward. That's, that's the, the, the author's intention here. That's his pastoral method. So then, so then I talk about it here. I already introduced it, but the practical theology says, Hebrew addresses the problem of the lapsed, those who have renounced or abandoned their faith. <coughs> and I think I've already covered that well enough. You can read that. So let me spend the rest of our time here this morning on the, the old num point number two, Roman numeral two, the Old Testament background to Hebrews. There are many passages we don't have time to read this morning, but I put them here in your text so that you can read about them. But the, the giving of the Ten Commandments, the teaching about the New Covenant in Jeremiah, in Leviticus, the teaching about the need for blood sacrifice. All of those ideas and all of those teachings from the Old Covenant were in the author's mind. And that's how we know that because they're everywhere in the book of Hebrews. And so his idea is to start with what they already believed and what they knew and then show how what they have in Christ is either the fulfillment of that or it's superior to what came before. So let's take a look at the, let's go through these three points here. The atonement theology of Hebrews is built on the Levitical cultus. Cultus just means the practice of their rituals. That's where they brought the animals, they slaughtered the animals, they sprinkled the blood on the altar. That's their cultus, that's their practice. And the writer sees the Christian covenant as growing out of the Mosaic covenant. The sacrifice of blood is essential for forgiveness. So let's take a look at one passage. Chapter 9, beginning in verse 18. Um, all right, as I, as I said earlier, these are, these are some of the verses where the writer insists that based on the Old Covenant, we should still believe that the blood has to be sacrificed, it has to be shed in order for sins to be forgiven. And so, and so this whole idea of Jesus needing to be, Jesus dying on the cross for our sins comes from passages like this. Now there are other passages in Paul and elsewhere, but this is one of the clearest passages because here the writer is saying, just as in the Old Testament animals were sacrificed temporarily and then they had to be done over and over again. Now, Jesus has been sacrificed once for all time as the perfect sacrifice. But we should see his shedding of blood in light of the Jewish background. And so in his context, this made perfect sense. Right? If you're Jewish and you were raised with animal sacrifices and then, then the Christian teacher says Jesus' death is just like those animal sacrifices, only better. You would understand as a Jewish per person that parallel. The problem today is that 
You didn't grow up with that. You didn't have animal sacrifice in your background. And many people around the world don't have animal sacrifice uh, you know, in, the, in, a, in the modern world or in many parts of the world. And so it's harder for them to understand. Like the Buddhists, for example, we try to tell them about the Christian gospel, they don't understand the idea of a blood sacrifice because it's not part of their religious tradition. Okay. I'm going to come back to this just in, in a minute, so let me hold off. The first B, the writer does not invalidate the old law and the cult, but he stresses its inadequacy to do what Christ in the new covenant can do. And C, the new covenant in Jesus' ministry were considered by early Christians to be fulfillments of Old Testament prophecies, especially Jeremiah 31, and select Psalms 2, 45, 102, 104, 110, in just the first chapter alone. Conclusions on Hebrews. This letter or sermon emphasizes the superiority of Jesus as a prophet, priest, and king of a new covenant to the old covenant. It's a message of grace through our Lord Jesus' sacrifice and priesthood and through God's loving discipline. It is a warning against apostasy and rebellion, but also an encouragement to simply rest in God's promise, persevering to the end in faith, living by hope, joy, and thanksgiving while we wait for the fulfillment of God's promises. The significance of Hebrews for understanding contextualization Hebrews is an excellent example of putting the gospel in language, its concepts and terms, that would be understood in a particular context. That's what I was saying earlier. The entire presentation assumes Jewish readers who are very familiar with the Jewish faith, traditions, and history. The question raised for theologians, pastors, and evangelists today is, should Hebrews be taken as the way to understand the meaning of Jesus' life and death, or just one way? Are we free to talk about the meaning of Jesus' person, death, and ministry in completely different terms that would be better understood in our, our context? For example, for those who know nothing about priests, high priests, animal sacrifices, and temples, would it be better to hear about God's saving work through Christ in different metaphors? If so, how will we know if the metaphors we choose are still faithful to Christ and the gospel? So do you understand this, this issue I'm raising? I think it's, it's, a, it's a legitimate question. Now traditional Christians, evangelical Christians, conservative Christians would say, no, if the Bible says it, then we have to teach it the way the Bible says it. And that's, that's been pretty much the view for 2,000 years. All right, so that's not strange, that's, that's normal. <clears throat> but in our modern theological discussion, there are people that, are, that struggle with A, they don't like this idea of blood sacrifice, they think it sounds barbaric. It's, that sounds very primitive. They don't think it's worthy of God. Uh, that's just a, an opinion, okay? Some people feel that way. Some people are concerned that the idea of a blood sacrifice makes no sense to, say, the Buddhists around us. So we want to share with them Jesus, but if we talk about things like blood sacrifice, they, they may shake their heads and say, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't understand that. And... And so, and then there's the discussion, and I have an appendix here about atonement. And there are some different views of atonement uh, that have been uh, held over the centuries. This, this battery is going out, I think. Uh, there are di different ideas about atonement. And it's in one of the appendices. You can look at that if you want. And so, there hasn't always been an emphasis on the substitutionary atonement as Jesus died for our sins. And so I think it's, it's legitimate for us here at seminary, in your theology classes, to question, do we have to talk about blood sacrifice? Do we have to talk about Jesus as a blood sacrifice? Perhaps, 
perhaps it's better to, to see his sacrifice on the cross more like a hero. It's a heroic sacrifice of his life on behalf of, of, of justice. He was killed because he, was, he stood up for those who were persecuted. And so instead we see him more as a great martyr. And so more like Aung San in, in, in here in Myanmar, the general who's assassinated for standing up for the people, right? So maybe he's more like that. So I, I don't know what the answer is, but I think it's, it's fair to have the theological conversation. And, and so in this class, New Testament theology, I mostly want you to know the text, understand what the writer of Hebrews, his context and why he presented his theology the way he did. But then the next step, how do you bring that to today? Uh, I think you need to think about it. I don't know the answer myself. Uh, I'm wrestling with it myself. Uh, I, because I, I think it's a fair intellectual question. Um, but until I feel like I know a different answer, I stay with the answer that I'm given. Uh, because I trust more in the scripture than my own opinion. Um, but it's fair in a theological context for us to ask these questions. In this session, we're going to talk about uh, James. Uh, now, James is a very controversial book in the New Testament. So I want you to, we're going to look at the, the, the lecture notes, uh, but I want you to just know from the beginning that this lecture is very, very important for, for your understanding of the role of works in, when, in the Christian faith. Uh, this is a big theological question. What exactly is the, is the proper role of works? We talked a lot about this when we talked about Paul, but now James gives a different answer. Okay, is everybody ready? All right. So reading from the, the guide in James, we see a decidedly Jewish perspective that understands Christian identity primarily in communal terms. That means community. As in Matthew and Hebrews, James sees our identity as something created by God's initiative and brought into existence through the covenants, tracing back to Abraham. No one is in relationship with God in a vacuum. We are part of a community of believers even a family of God, comprised of brothers and sisters sharing the same covenant with God. Despite differences in emphases among various biblical writers, all agree that building our spiritual house, all right, that's the metaphor we're going to use today, building a house, all right? A house, well, not all houses, but, but the, the houses that are built of concrete or bricks, they have a foundation underneath. You dig in the ground and create a foundation. You build the building and you put a roof on it. So that's the metaphor we're going to use this morning to talk about your spiritual faith and your spiritual life. And so <clears throat> what I'm saying here is that the biblical writers have used different metaphors and ideas about how you, you and I can build our spiritual house or our identity. But it requires both reliance on God and human faith and effort. Believers must rely on the grace and activity of God for forgiveness and even the ability to believe in God's promises. At the same time, true believers must live by faith, be obedient to God's will, and fulfill the covenant responsibilities, requirements, including doing good work. <coughs> However, the various writers emphasize different aspects of these truths differently due to wanting to address concerns such as misunderstandings, confusion, laxity, etc. in their particular context. So James' theological issues. Frank Matera, who are our textbook for this course, Frank Matera says that James poses the biggest challenge to the unity in the New Testament. 
for Luther, the challenge was so great that he wanted to reject James altogether from the canon. All right? Here's the chief theological issue. The teaching of James appears to either contradict or seriously conflict with Paul's doctrine of justification by grace through faith alone. His emphasis on works and his stance on faith without works in chapter 2 verses 14 following <coughs> suggests a complete ignorance of the Pauline polemical intent of his theology. I know you might not understand all of those words, but I'm going to explain them more. A likely hypothesis is that James knew of the early tradition of the doctrine of faith apart from works that Paul championed. But he was not specifically acquainted with Paul's writings, if they'd even been written yet. Thus he was not attacking Paul per se, but was attacking in a different way the same kinds of people who twisted Paul's teaching to interpret the doctrine of grace as a premise for licentiousness. All right, that's what Raymond Martin argues. In the absence of any clear Christology or soteriology, it appears assumed, James should be read as a corrective, not as an alternative theological tradition on par with Paul's formulation of justification by grace through faith. So in other words, Paul taught we're saved by grace through faith alone. James teaches faith without works is dead. So here's the issue. Do they, do they contradict each other? Are they opposed to each other? Some people say yes. Martin Luther thought yes. I'm saying not necessarily. I see James as a correction or corrective for those who have misunderstood Paul. I think that's a, a, an equally possible hypothesis. Right, so you have to decide. I want you to think about that today. Is James, does James contradict Paul or does he correct a misunderstanding of Paul? All right, let's go on. The heart of James' theology. In spite of James' well-known emphasis on works, Faith is still critical to his spirituality. If you ask anybody who studied New Testament, what does James believe in? What are they going to say? What, what is James known for? <laughs> works. That's, that's the answer you should give. Works. He believes in works. Practical Christian works. That's what James is known for. So what I'm saying in this point number one is that's not completely true. It's, it's certainly true, but it's not complete. He also believed in faith. And, and faith is still critical to his spirituality. Faith is the key to handling trials, to overcoming doubt, to receiving wisdom from God, to living out true religion, to acting in ways that demonstrate a belief in one's ultimate accountability to God. Faith is important for receiving forgiveness and healing. Yet it is clear that faith, quote unquote, is not mere intellectual assent. Do you know that, that, that phrase, intellectual assent? You know what that means? Intellectual assent means that I can say, I agree with that. Oh, okay. Um, and, but it doesn't mean that it's in my heart. I don't really believe in it. So a great example of that is, is, is the belief in justice. Like how many of you believe that justice, that, that the world, that, sh that there should be more justice in the world? Raise your hand. Only a few of you? Okay, do you understand the question? How many of you believe there should be more justice, fair treatment of people in this world? Raise your hand. Okay, if you don't believe that, 
then we should have a special session later. <laughs> because there is serious injustice in this world. Oppression of people, slavery of people, um, exploitation of people. That's unjust. People who are taken to court but not treated properly in the court. People who are arrested and thrown in jail uh, for, for political purposes. The world's full of injustice. Okay? And I would hope that every single person in this room would believe there needs to be more justice in this world. All right? The reason I'm bringing that up as an example is James also believed there needs to be more justice in the world. He was very concerned about the lack of justice. He was concerned about injustice, the lack of justice. That's the context. There were poor people who were being exploited. There were people who were suffering. People who were being neglected. There were rich people in the church. They could come to the church and if a rich person came in, they said, oh, come in, come in. Take this, this really nice seat. And the poor person's like, you go to the back, go to the back. You don't have any money, you don't have nice clothes, you go to the back. The rich person gets to sit here. James says, that, that's terrible. That should never be in the Christian church. It's unjust. It's wrong. Plus, plus, <laughs> these are the very people who are exploiting the poor people. How dare you give them the special place of honor? Don't you know it's the rich who are exploiting the poor? So James is very angry about the social situation. That's why I think you should love the book of James. Because he's a, he's a great example of speaking out against injustice. And so in this context of injustice that James is writing to, what I'm saying is he's also talking about faith. He doesn't just believe in works or correcting injustice. He still believes in faith. He still says you have to have faith in God for the forgiveness of your sins. You have to have faith in God for, for healing, for helping, for encouragement. Faith is still very important to James. But it's important that we understand how to define faith. That's what James is saying. Faith is not mere intellectual assent. And so that was that term I started with a few minutes ago. And assent means I nod my head. And so my illustration was about justice. So if I were to go to a, a white, wealthy congregation in the United States, not everybody, okay, but let's say some, and I might say, do you believe in justice? They would all nod their heads and say, yes, we believe in justice. That's intellectual assent. They say, yes, I believe in that. I thought all of you would say yes, but you fooled me. You didn't all say yes. <laughs> so I'm baffled. I, I don't know the answer. I think it must be the English. I hope it's the English. But if you're in a country where there's oppression, you most certainly, everybody should believe in, in a need for more justice. But in an affluent country, they may not know that. They know it in their head, maybe, intellectually, but they, their behavior doesn't change. What James is saying is, if you say you have faith in God, it can't just be something you believe in your head. You're like, oh yes, I believe in God. I believe in justice. I believe in goodness up here. He says, there has to be action. There, has to be, there have to be works. If you don't show me that you believe in this, I say you don't believe in it. Now you say, I, yes, I believe in that. I believe in goodness and justice. He says, if you don't show me, what you believe is dead. That's what James is saying. These are strong words. Now in Hebrews, I showed you some strong words about lapsing. Because that's what Hebrews was concerned about, the writer of the Hebrews. But now I'm going to show you some harsh words from James. 
Because his concern is not so much about lapsing, his concern is about empty Christianity, empty faith, intellectual assent without works. And he has some very strong words about that. And so that's why point number two here is that the thrust of James is largely on the practical outworking of faith. So I'm going to read, we're going to look at a, at a few passages here. Now I'm going to give you an example. Now I just gave you an example of where the pastor sometimes has to be bold and almost harsh with his congregation. All right? So you have to be prepared as future pastors to speak the word that needs to be spoken. Sometimes it's a kind word, an encouraging word, and sometimes it's a word of rebuke. Right? So there's not just one type of way to be a pastor. You have to be willing and able to speak whatever word is needed by your context. So think about, th think about these words in James. Think about him standing up and preaching on Sunday morning. He says, those of you who consider yourself religious, but you don't control what you say, that's a rain on your tongues. That's like a rain on a horse. Holding the horse back, hold your tongue back. He says, you're deceiving yourselves. That means you're lying to yourselves. Your religion's worthless. Doesn't sound very pastoral, does it? He, but, but he's speaking the truth. He's trying to wake them up. He's saying, wake up. Come on. What are you thinking? If you're out there talking, talking trash to all sorts of people, your religion's worthless. So knock it off. That's what he's saying. Religion that our God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. What? To look after orphans and widows in their distress. And to keep oneself being polluted from being polluted by the world. Usually people talk about James as, as the gospel for social work, social action. The social gospel. In other words, what God wants is for us to care about people. And that's absolutely right. So that's the first thing you should see here is if your church only preaches the gospel about being forgiven, God's love and forgiveness, it's incomplete. Your church, you need to also be preaching about caring for the widows and orphans in their distress. Every member of your church in my opinion, based on the teaching of James, should be involved in social action. Maybe it's just caring for their own widows and orphans. That's okay. They don't have to join a committee. But everybody in your church needs to understand that if they're a Christian and they say they believe in Jesus, what James is saying is if you believe in Jesus, you have to believe in caring about the poor and the suffering people in your community. So do it. That's what he's saying. Now the second part of this is keep yourself from being polluted by the world. That's what the liberals sometimes, the, liberal, the liberals are normally the ones who identify with the social action group, right? The, the peacemakers. And they're, they're those who are promoting peace and harmony and social action. I love those people, okay? Because they want to change the world for the better. But sometimes they neglect the second message. James was also concerned about morality, sexual morality, interpersonal morality, how we treat one another. He says, don't be, he says, religion that God approves is also means keeping ourselves pure and not allowing ourselves to become polluted by the world. So both are important. And you'll hear me say this over and over again that a faithful interpretation of the Bible is not conservative or liberal. It's not about the gospel or about social action. It's about all of those things in the right balance. Don't try to, don't join one camp or another. Step back and look at the whole teaching of, of the New Testament and say what are all of the values and the priorities? And it includes theology. It includes gospel. It includes a personal experience, a personal relationship with God. 
and it includes caring for the poor and the needy, the orphans and the widows, and it includes moral purity. So all of those things are taught in the New Testament. All are important. Now let's look at the, the most controversial passage in James. Chapter 2, 14 through 19. Um, okay, so th this is the, the famous passage in James. The one that's controversial. And, and, and do you, do, could you understand it? Can you understand the English? Um, if somebody claims they have faith but has no deeds, he says, can of such a faith save them? It's implied, no. No. Last night I gave a lecture for LAP Freshers. And so some, one of them asked me, he said, well, is it, are we saved by faith alone or do we have to have works? Okay, that's a tricky question, isn't it? Because Paul said, we're saved by grace through faith. Not of works, lest any man should boast. So he says, faith alone, really. James says, no, no, it can't be faith alone. It has to be works. So that's, that's a theological question that I'm asking you to think about today. Is Paul right? Is it faith alone, by grace through faith alone? Or is it faith plus works, really? Well, James is saying, if you have faith, but you don't have deeds, you're not going to be saved. That's what he's saying. So he gives an example. Suppose a brother or sister is without <clears throat> clothes and daily food. You see, he's, he's interested in human suffering. He's interested in issues of justice. He's interested in issues where, where people are helpless and they need help. <clears throat> so if one of you says, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Have you ever done what he says in verse 16? Somebody comes and asks you for something. You say, oh, no, brother, I can't help you, but may God provide for your needs. I've done that. And I feel guilty. <laughs> I feel really guilty. Because <laughs> I remember this verse. I think, oh no, I just did what this verse said not to do. Because you know, you can't help everybody, right? You can't help everybody. And that's true. But do we use that as an excuse to hold on to what we have and not help those in need? Well, to me, this is a very challenging verse. I don't think we're supposed to help everybody. But I do think we're supposed to be very uncomfortable with saying no to people because of this teaching here. Because of the human tendency towards selfishness. See, this is what we're really getting at here, or what I think James is getting at, is a Christianity that's self-centered. That's what we have to be careful about. A Christianity that says, well, I'll go to the church if, <clears throat> or I'll go to God if he'll forgive my sins because that helps me. And so in other words, my faith is all about me. Or I'll go to the church if they help me. If they don't help me, I won't go. <clears throat> it's all about me. I'm self-centered. And what James is trying to teach is that Christianity is never about self-centeredness. It rejects self-centeredness. Yes, you yourself will be helped by being a Christian. Of course, your sins will be forgiven. You will receive peace and joy and hope. But, but Christianity is always communal. In other words, when you accept Christ as your Savior, you join a community of brothers and sisters in Christ. <clears throat> and as a result, they become your family in God. And you have a responsibility to your family. And so if you say, I only care about me and my salvation, you know, I don't care about helping them, you are denying the faith, James would say. You have to care about both, yourself and your brother and sister in need. And so then he talks about that. And I love verse 19. You say that you believe in one God. Good. 
Even the demons believe that. And shudder. Shudder means they shake in fear. So are the demons going to be saved in the end? No. Paul, James does not believe that. What is his argument? What he's saying is just believing in God is not enough. So I believe that God is one. I'm a good Jew. I'm a good Muslim. I'm a good Christian. I believe God is one God. And James would say, so what? Even the demons believe there's one God. He said, what matters is that you believe in the God and you follow this God. And you do what God wants you to do. That's what matters. So James, so contrary to what Martin Luther believed, I think James has a very important place in the canon. Because he doesn't get bogged down with a misunderstanding of Paul's teaching. He, there's no room for complacency or laziness in James. He says, it's actually rather simple for James. He says, you believe in Jesus? That's really good. You need Jesus. But if, you, if it's true, if your faith is real, then you're going to show it by how you live. Isn't that that's simple? That's nothing strange about that, is it? So don't be confused by Paul's theology, James would say. Just put it into practice, and then you'll know what to do. Then you'll know what true theology is. I don't believe, though, that James is saying that we're saved by our works. Instead, I think what he's saying is really what Paul was saying. If you're truly saved, you're going to show it by your works. And if there are any works there, you're not saved. That's what he's saying. All right, let me go ahead and uh, let's finish this list here of of James' theology. Grace and a gracious God are presupposed. God is the giver of all good gifts and a compassionate and merciful. We depend upon the law of liberty and mercy. God's grace is the means by which we overcome the tendency of our spirits to pursue friendship with the world. Humble submission to God, not merit, is the basis for our hope in God's lifting us up. Forgiveness is available to those who seek it. Four, James called for faith and patience in the midst of hardships. Excuse me, James calls for faith and patience in the midst of hardships because God produces maturity through trials and answers the prayer of faith. Point five, liberation theological point of view. James' social consciousness condemns oppression and offers hope. Temez says, one of the basic purposes of the author is to inspire hope in the suffering Christian communities and perhaps in the poor who are not members of those communities but happen to read or know of this letter. The poor and oppressed rejoice because they hear the good news of a promise of liberation. Point six. True, true religion issues forth in impartiality, fairness, mercy, compassion, rejection of the world's values and lifestyle, patient endurance, hope in the midst of suffering, and faith in the miraculous. And finally, seven, James and Buddhism have a lot in common in terms of stressing practical moral behavior. However, there are significant differences in their different views of human identity and the role of God. And if you want to read more about that, you can go to appendix number eight in the back of your guide. So let me now finish this session by showing you this diagram that I drew on the board that's also in your, in your guide. Uh, so remember context, context, context. Context is always important for interpreting the biblical text. Well, certainly the New Testament text. Uh, maybe not the poetry of the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, yes. And so James' context is different from Paul's context. And so thus, when they present their arguments, they have, there, there's a different contrast. So let's start with Paul, because we did Paul before. <clears throat> and Paul says that if you are trusting in works, the works of the law, 
or uh, in your own efforts, your self effort, your, your house, this is your spiritual house. This is your foundation. Your foundation is your confidence in yourself. Then you're going to build a house full of works. Works, works, works. You follow the law, circumcise, you, you do everything you're supposed to do. He says, if you build your spiritual house like that, there's no hope for you. There's no hope for you. Why not? Because nobody can do this perfectly. He says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So even the best worker, the hardest worker, the most sincere Jewish person, Buddhist person, Christian person, who, work, who trusts in their works, is still going to fall short of God's perfect standard. And that's why he says, there's no hope in that. It sounds good, it sounds really good, but it doesn't work. His alternative is, in our foundation of our house, we need to trust in God, trust in Christ. Remember, you all memorize Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So, so he's saying that a foundation that's trust in God's grace, then your house, your house is going to be filled with grace and faith and love and yes, works. Not, not works in your foundation, like over here, but works as a sign. Verse 10, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, right? Which God prepared in advance for you to do. So works belong in the house, but not in the foundation. He said that, that's what provides real hope. And so for Paul, his context is with the, the Jewish people or the Judaizers who are trying, who give the impression that salvation really should be about faith and, and works in the foundation. Faith works is required, which really means ultimately depending on yourself. James is in a different context. So James is not talking to these people who are preaching works. He's talking to people that are, are preaching no works at all. This is the opposite problem. So in their foundation, they have faith without works. So what we're saying is, it's very likely that, that, the, that he's talking to people who believe this, but, but their life is empty. That's why I left this blank. There's nothing here. They're, they don't do anything. They go to church maybe. They say, I believe in God. I believe in one God. I believe in Christ. And but it's all up in their head. But their life doesn't show anything. And he says that's vain hope. Do you know the word vain? In vain means it's impossible. That means it's false hope. He says, these people, you're hoping for salvation? He says, forget it. There's no salvation for you. You have no hope. It's vain hope. He says, instead, faith is in your foundation, but, but I, James, define faith as works. He says, you show, you show me your faith without works, I'll show you my faith by my works. That's how you know I really have faith, is because I work. And that's why faith and works is what is going to be in his house. And if in your house there are faith and works, that's solid hope for the future. All right, do you see the contrast here? And it's very, it's very important to understand context and to understand, to interpret you know, James' message and Paul's message in light of who they are talking to. And I think then it becomes easier to see that, that James' idea of solid hope and Paul's idea of, of real hope really aren't that different. Now the language is different, I, I will admit. And I'm not trying to say that we shouldn't still struggle with this a little bit. But I, for me, it's a lot closer than it might seem. Okay, so th this, this, is a, this raises an issue of biblical interpretation. Because some of you are assuming that the Bible 
every biblical writer thinks the same way. And they don't. And so, that in, for most people growing up in the church, you just assume oh, th this is one book, right? The Bible. But it's not really one book, is it? How many books is it? 66. Right, but don't say 666. That's from Revelation. No, it's 66, only two sixes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, but, but in other words, there are many different authors of the Bible. E even though it's inspired by the Holy Spirit, there are different contexts and different emphases. And I, I mention that for two reasons. One, academically, we're supposed to look at each author separately. But, but also with that, <clears throat> a, a second point is, as I tried to show with my diagram of Paul and James, is sometimes teaching will, be, will sound different because the context is different. And sometimes they actually seem to disagree. But I think for the most part, the differences are because of context difference. You know, there's one place in Proverbs where there are two Proverbs, one right after the other, that say just the opposite. And I, it's a great example. I don't remember the number. But I think it's a, something about listening to fools. So like if you listen to a fool, um, it's unwise. But if you don't listen to a fool, that's also unwise. I'm sorry, I don't remember the verse. I'll, I'll look it up for you. But two verses say just the opposite. And what that says to me is every teaching of the Bible has a particular context. So sometimes this is true, but sometimes this is true. And so in this area of, of forgiveness, backsliding, falling away, repentance, we should look at all of the teaching of the Bible in order to form our theology. In this class, we tend to look at author by author. And so, what you're really doing by this question is you're combining multiple authors together. And that's okay uh, in trying to understand this ultimately what your theology is going to be. But if we're only looking at Hebrews, I tried to say that there are two issues about backsliding. One is a moral issue, continuing to sin and to go contrary to God's law. And then there is a second issue, and that's lapsing or, or denying your faith under the, under the situation of persecution. And so falling away could come from either one of those. Uh, the backsliding idea, that word is not used, I don't think, in Hebrews. But the idea is probably more moral. Whereas falling away is probably more the renouncing one's faith out of fear of persecution. <laughs> so he's not talking about forgiving other people. That, not sure that for your group, that's the point. He's not talking, so when Jesus says forgive others seven times, he's talking about you forgiving your sister if she's hurt you. When, it, when the writer of Hebrews is writing, he's talking about the church as a whole. So we, we, we have to think differently. The biblical instruction to you as an individual is different from instruction to you as a church leader. Okay? So that's the, that's the first difference. So when you're thinking about should we welcome back in people, I'm thinking like a church leader, I'm going to recognize that those who, who turn away, either God's going to judge them, the backsliders, or those who fall away, it's impossible for them to return to the church. He's not talking about individual forgiveness. So I think that's the most I can say about that. Repentance means 
You're turning direction. You turn. So repentance can mean you, you're sorry for your sin, you confess your sin, and you say to God, I'm going to change. So in Acts chapter 2, when Peter preached his sermon, we saw this yesterday, they were cut to the heart. They said, what shall we do? He says, repent and be baptized. So in other words, admit that you're wrong. You were wrong about Jesus. You were wrong to kill him. Repent and say, I was wrong. God, forgive me. And then now become a follower of Jesus. <coughs> I think repentance in Hebrews basically means to, if you've fallen away, to come back and join the church again. I think in that context is what it means for falling away. For backsliding, repentance means turning away from sin. So you see, in every case, you need to know the context for, for, for these ideas. <coughs> uh, I think that's enough. Well, let me add this. We cannot reconstruct the original context perfectly. So in other words, we don't know really what he means when he says it's impossible to turn back. If you did an exegetical study, you would discover that there are two to five different possible interpretations you know, in the history of interpretation. That's a good exegetical paper. Not for this class, but for another class. So in other words, we don't know for sure. So the question you might be asking is, how does that apply to me? Well, I would say is <clears throat> to apply this teaching for, your life, for yourself personally and for your church, I think you should always assume that repentance is possible. Forgiveness is possible. Don't ever tell somebody, well, God won't forgive you anymore. Okay, you screwed up too many times. All right, we talked about this sin five times, too many. You're done. Okay, no, we don't talk that way as pastors. We always invite people to repent. We always invite people back. But he, here's the truly scary thing. Have you ever read A Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan? Has anybody read A Pilgrim's Progress? Oh, I'm so sorry about that. Because that's one of the greatest books in English literature. Now, I know it's been translated into Burmese. But he talks in that book, it's a story about a, a pilgrim who travels on his journey for salvation. And one of the people he meets on his journey is a person who lives in a big cage. He can't get out of that cage because he can't repent. And the frightening thing is that the reason he can't repent is because his heart is hardened. That's what you should be afraid of. It's not that God won't forgive you, it's that you won't repent. And that's the real danger of continuing in sin. If you continue to do wrong, your heart will grow hard. So much so that you might say, you know what, I don't, I don't want to change. I don't want to give up my sin. And that means you no longer can repent. And the writer of Hebrews says, that's when you're in real danger. You can't come back. You can't be forgiven. And you're going to experience the wrath of God. And so, that's another reason we take sin seriously. It's not, it's not that just that you're going to be punished. It's that you will change. Sin will change you. And it will corrupt you. And it will, can destroy your faith. And I know many people who have become atheists turned away from God. But the beginning of their turn was not intellectual. They say it's intellectual, but it wasn't. It was their heart grew hardened because of sin in their life. That's part of what Hebrews is warning us against. Number two, did James devalue the power of grace? Now I'm thinking well, that when you say that, you ask that question, it's because he says faith without works is dead. And so he's implying that you have to work 
otherwise you won't be saved. And so you're wondering if that means he's devaluing the power of grace to save people. Is that right? In these verses, James is calling the people to repent. He says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity and means hostility against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. What he means by friend of the world, he doesn't mean friendly. He means that you, you accept the secular ways of the world, the, the ways that live in rebellion against God, against God's uh, spiritual laws and moral laws. That's what he means by friendship with the world. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit that he has caused to dwell in us? That means God gave you a spirit to live. That's, that's your life spirit. That's a gift from God. But that spirit is your human life. If you make friends, he gave you that spirit to be in a relationship with him. That's the most important thing is you were created to be in a relationship with God, a loving relationship with God. And so your calling is to cultivate that relationship. Use that spirit within you to reach out to God, to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. That's God's will for you. But if you give your mind and your heart to sinful ways, rebellious ways, then that means your heart will be in love with the world. It'll be in love with wickedness, sinfulness. And that's what he means is the Holy Spirit is jealous because he wants your heart. He wants your spirit. But you've given it to another lover. You've given it to the world. That's what he's, he's teaching here. Now verse 6. But he gives us more grace. In other words, even though we tend to give our hearts to the world, to selfishness, to sinfulness. James says, but he gives you more grace. This is why scripture says God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. In other words, even though you are a sinner, even though you give your heart to the world, if you humble yourself before the Lord, he will lift you up. So no is my answer to your question. He does not devalue grace. He calls you to work because that's God's will for your life. But he knows very well that you cannot do God's will without God's grace. But he doesn't want you to think that if you have God's grace, you can just relax, be lazy, be selfish, and be sinful. That's not the, a right understanding of grace. He rejects that false understanding of Paul's teaching. He says, yes, you need grace, but grace is repentance, depends on repentance and asking God to help you forward. What does that look like? How do I really repent according to, to how do I really humble myself before God? Well, that's what he talks about in verses 7 through 10. He says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. You see, when we preach God's grace and God's love and the possibility of forgiveness for sins, our response should not be to say, okay, great, that's, I'm all taken care of. Great, and just go on sinning. No, no. Your response should be the same as the people in Acts chapter 2. You should be cut to the heart and say, oh, what should I do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized. Well, you're already baptized. But when the Spirit speaks to you, you should repent. James says, when you realize you're a sinner, what should you do? Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. 
You know, wash your hands, you sinners. In other words, say, I'm done with sin. Now, you may need to do that every day, right? Because every one of us is a sinner. But every day we're called back to repentance. This is how you have a spiritually vital life. This is all in James. All right, so don't interpret James to simply be a social gospel. It's not true. Yes, it's social, absolutely social, but it's also spiritual. And spirituality can never just be good works. Never. Nowhere in, in the New Testament, not even James. He expects that a person who does works will also be a person who's humble before God, who repents of his sins or her sins, and, and depends upon the grace of God for your very spiritual life. When we preach a gospel that's only social work, when we preach a holistic gospel that's really only about doing good, be careful because it can very easily become humanism. It can be driven by your pride and your desire to save yourself. And you can link arms with other people who want to change the world and make it better. But if it comes out of a prideful attitude, an angry spirit, a self-righteous spirit, it's not the spirit of God. And it won't be spiritual. It'll be human. And human efforts are destined to fail. But a spiritually humble man or woman who seeks to change the world through the power of God, that person can succeed. That's James. Okay? So a long answer, but this is so important to James theology. Thank you for your question. Let's go back now to, can we be saved by faith without works? <coughs> no, we cannot. All right? But what I've tried to tell you over and over again is the issue is not, do we have works or not? We have to have works. But works don't save you. Works come along with the person who's already saved. So in other words, we're saved by grace through faith. It's a gift. But if you have the gift, you will do works. And if you don't do works, you don't have the gift. That's what John Calvin taught. That's what Martin Luther taught. That's what all the reformers believed. Of course you have to work. But if you don't work to be saved. You work as a sign that you are saved. Do you understand the difference? Nalela? Okay, if you don't understand this, maybe you should write your, your New Testament theology paper on the subject. Because you need to understand the difference. Because you're going to have to preach about this to your people. They won't understand the difference if you don't understand the difference. And so, compare the demons, Abraham and Rahab. Well, the demons believed in God and they're not saved because they never repented of their sin. They don't repent, they don't follow Jesus. And so they, they're not saved. Abraham is saved by his works, James says. Rahab is saved by her works. He uses them both as examples. But really, look at it. He's just trying to prove a point. And his point is, what you do shows the faith you have. The very interesting thing is that Paul used the example of Abraham as an opposite example. The same story of Abraham in Romans chapter 4, he proves that Abraham is saved by faith without works. James uses the same story of Abraham to say, look, that proves he's saved by works, and not faith alone. Uh, it's very funny, I think, but it doesn't mean that they, to me, it doesn't mean that they, they disagree. It means that they look at the same story and find two different lessons. I don't think we should say which one's right. I think we should say, 
Look, this one example of Abraham teaches us two things. And let, let's, let's embrace both lessons. Now, some of you might not like that answer. You may say, no, you should decide which one's right. And I say, I can't. I can't. Because I think they're both right. But they're right in different ways. According to James, number four, can we be righteous without faith and works? No. You cannot be righteous without faith and works. But this, this raises a, a very important interpretive question for all of the New Testament. What is the meaning of righteousness? Doing the will of God. Righteousness is, a, a righteous person does the will of God. So from the Old Testament, any righteous person was someone who followed the law of God. They were a member of the covenant community who, who did what was right. But in Acts, we find out there were even righteous people outside of the covenant community. So that means righteousness was about action, primarily. If you did what was right, that means you follow God's law, you follow God's will. We're not talking about being circumcised right now or, or, or Sabbath. We're talking about being a moral person, a fair person, an honest person. Okay, those are the things in the Old Testament law, the moral law. If you, if you took care of the poor and needy, the Old Testament prophets, then you were a righteous person. You made sacrifices, you made offerings, you did the good things. That made you a righteous person. That's the Jewish understanding of righteousness. What Paul does, Paul does not reject that idea of righteousness. But what he says is that the gospel introduces a new idea that, that a righteousness apart from the law is now possible by the grace of God. And so now we have two definitions of righteousness. Or I should say two different ways to become righteous. If righteousness means that I now have a right or correct relationship with God, the Jewish idea was I could be right with God if I do right things. All the things we talked about. I do the will of God. Paul says you can have a right relationship with God if you believe that God gives you righteousness as a gift. So you may not do everything that's right. In fact, you can't. It's not possible. You are a sinner. And that you are permanently limited in your ability to be righteous in your own power. But if you believe that by God's grace through faith, he will count you as righteousness, regard you as righteous because of Jesus, then you will be saved. So righteousness still means a right relationship with God, but the Jewish idea of righteousness by action is replaced by righteousness by grace through faith. But in practice, in the Christian church, the idea of righteousness continued on in both senses. And so what we have is we have the teachings of Paul and Hebrews and James and 1 Peter. And here we have the ideas that we are still called to be righteous by our actions. But here's the difference. We can't depend upon our righteousness to earn our salvation anymore. So that's the shift. We still want to be right with God. We still want to do, we're still called to do right. But we have to have the foundation being the grace of God by faith. And then from that foundation, we can learn how to live as righteous people. So this, my dear students, you have to learn how to explain. I know it's a little complicated, but you have to be able to talk about Two different ideas of righteousness, 
and how they come together. How they're different and how they come together. Because this is really about the relationship of faith and works. And it's one of the most practical and most important relevant principles for your, your preaching and teaching in the church. How about in the Myanmar context? Do they emphasize salvation by faith alone? I only know what you tell me. <laughs> so I've had many students tell me that this is a problem. That there are many churches. Uh, I've actually not had any Karen, uh, Kiyan uh, students tell me about this. So you have to tell me if you're Kiyan, uh, what what's true in your churches. But I've had more Chin people and some Kachin people tell me there's a lot of, of emphasis on grace and faith and not enough emphasis on works and righteousness. So that's all I know. So you're going to have to decide for yourself whether there's too much emphasis. According to James 1, 26 and 27, can we be saved only by doing good works without faith or belief in Jesus Christ? Okay, let's... Jesus, the name Jesus only appears twice in the whole book of James. But don't interpret that to mean that James doesn't care about Jesus. So we'll look at that quickly. 1-1 one, one, and 2-1. So in James 1-1 one, one, he says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, Lord means master, ruler. So if he says Jesus Christ is his Lord, that means that he is a follower of Jesus Christ. So even though the whole letter talks about, most of the letter talks about doing good deeds, caring for widows and orphans, he assumes that you have faith in Jesus Christ. So my answer to your question is no. He doesn't, you cannot be righteous. You cannot please God without faith in Jesus Christ. He doesn't talk about it, but he assumes it by his own introduction. And then in chapter, I don't know why, 2-1, okay. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. All right? So, again, no. He's not teaching that you can be righteous, do good deeds apart from faith in Christ. He is assuming that everybody he's written to already believe in Jesus. And what does he think about Jesus? He's glorious. He loves Jesus. All right? So don't, don't misinterpret James and don't believe anybody who does. And think that it's just about doing good deeds. And that's not in the New Testament. Can we, be say, can we say sharing and caring for the poor and needy is part of believing in God? Uh, yes, absolutely is part of believing in God. But it's more than believing in God. It's about a relationship with God. What are, what are the chief characteristics of God? What do we say? John chapter 3, verse 16. For God... Yeah, for God loved the world. We, we say God's a loving God. So if you have a relationship with a loving God, and you know this God, you love this God, you follow this God, then... You're going to do what he does. You're going to love others. How do you love others? You don't just love them in your heart. Oh, I love you, brother. I'm sorry, I can't help you, but I love you, brother. I love you, sister. I hope somebody helps you. Not me, but I hope somebody does. That's not love. Love is caring and sharing. Absolutely. So I like that. I like that. I know they say that at MIT. You know, true religion is sharing and caring. That's good. It's short. It's quick. It's not complete. It's incomplete. But it's good. It's a nice short saying. Uh, can we be saved by sharing and caring? No. Okay, right? Don't think that way. Eight. What kinds of deeds give us salvation? All right? I think we've already talked about this. There are no deeds that give you salvation. Salvation comes first. The deeds follow. Is, now, I love this question. <laughs> is offering taking from gains from selling drugs? Uh, in other words, is selling drugs good work? Now, you might think that's a crazy question. <laughs> but I'm told 
that there are Christians who are selling drugs and giving some money to the church. Well, <coughs> this is actually a bigger question. In the United States, we have mafia. Do you know mafia? In the Catholic Church, they're mafia. And sometimes they like to, they steal money, they rob people, they kill people. They get lots of money. And sometimes they give it to the Catholic Church. Not all of it, just some of it. Well, some churches take the money. Some churches refuse. They say, we don't want this money. It's blood money. We don't want it. So, Christians have different views on this subject. But let me say two things about this. Uh, selling drugs is wrong. Right? It's immoral. Because the people you sell drugs to often become addicts. You're destroying their lives. It's also illegal. Alright? So when you participate in, in unrighteous activity, don't think that you can make it better by giving some money to God. Alright? That may make you feel better, but I think you're confusing the issue. You need to repent of this. That's the first comment. Second comment is, I don't really know what it's like to live it in an environment where it's so difficult to find money that you feel tempted to sell drugs. So, I would try not to judge a poor person who sells drugs, just as honestly I wouldn't judge a poor person who, who sells her body for prostitution. Do I think prostitution is right? No. But a woman who can find no other way to earn money to feed her family, I don't condemn her. But it's not good, okay? So don't call what evil good. But if you must accept it or if you must, if you must talk to prostitutes and drug dealers, um, criminals, don't forget to love these people. Try to understand their circumstances. But don't call what's bad good. And pray for wisdom to know how to talk to them. All right, that's a very big subject, but I try to, try to help you understand that it, sometimes it's complicated. Uh, don't be soft on it, but also don't be harsh either. Uh, okay, I, I, I feel like that's an inadequate answer, but that's a partial answer. Last question, can, we, can those who don't confess their faith get salvation? For example, a Buddhist who believes in Christ but does not want to convert. Sometimes there are Muslims who know that they'll be killed if they, if they publicly confess, so they still go to the mosque, they participate in Islam, but they're secretly believers in Jesus. You know, in the history of the church, Christian leaders have taken different positions on this subject. It's not a new question. Some would say, you have to confess, Romans 10, 9, and 10. You must confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. If you don't confess, you're not saved. If you're not baptized, you're not saved. And that's, that is the general answer. So if somebody comes to you and says, do I need to be baptized? You should say, yes, you need to be baptized. At the same time, I'm not going to judge the person who says that I have to be a Christian in secret, otherwise they're going to kill me. I think it's very, it's very difficult for me to tell someone you must be baptized knowing that if they're baptized that they might die. So that's a difficult question for me. Um, so, again I've said many times, we're not the judge. You're not the judge of somebody else. You're not God. But it is your job to try to steer people in the right direction. So I would encourage such a person to, to really pray with their hearts. Pray sincerely and say, and ask God to show them. God, do I need to have the courage to step forward and, ta and take the risk of being rejected by my family and even being persecuted? Because the answer is likely yes. But, but maybe your job is to walk with them, to pray with them, and encourage them to ask God. There's some very, very strong, important teaching in the scriptures that you need to know, learn, and be able to teach others. And at the same time, you need to develop your ability to handle the, 
the, the tensions in Scripture. Paul says this, James says that, uh, Jesus says that, how, and, and to learn how to balance these things. That's part of your education. And then thirdly, I hope you will also develop pastoral sensitivity. Because sometimes a person who's struggling with sin needs gentleness and kindness from you. Sometimes they need a challenge and a sharp rebuke from you. I can't tell you which it is. You need to pray about that and ask God for wisdom. But no matter what, have courage. Don't be a coward. Don't be afraid. Don't try to please them. Because that's not from the Spirit of God. But if you truly trust in the Spirit to guide you, and you pray for courage and strength, sometimes the answer is going to be mercy and gentleness. Sometimes the answer is going to be boldness. And, and let the Spirit and Scripture guide you. All right, receive now the benediction. Now may the God of grace and mercy who gives you hope for salvation through Jesus Christ. May that same God also give you clarity and truth and courage and strength to live a righteous life, a moral life, a life of mercy and goodness and kindness to others. And also a, a life that, that speaks truth to other people, the word they need to hear even if it's unpopular or it's difficult, as James has shown us by his example. May this God go with you, developing your mind, developing your heart, teaching you to be better disciples of Jesus and better ministers in the name of Jesus. Amen.